Most people here are neighbors and not lace makers. Do we have any lace makers here? Okay, so then I will first see if I can back up. Okay, the particular style of lace that Marion made was English Honiton bobbin lace. In the world of antique lace, no two people ever agree on what to call a piece of lace. Honiton is also sometimes called Point Angleterre, but that name is also used for something else. And it's also called Devonshire and assorted other things. So Honiton is probably the most popular name for this type of lace now. So I never get into arguments with people over what to call lace. I just say, I am calling it this for these reasons. And if you choose another name, fine. Uh, okay, uh, English Honiton bobbin lace is a form of, okay, first of all, bobbin lace is a form of off-loom weaving. If you imagine a loom with the warp threads going here, fastened at top and bottom, and then the weft or woof or whatever it is, uh, going the other way. Now, if you were to cut those warp threads, and they can go in any direction, if you attach them to bobbins as a weight to control it and as a source of thread, you can go in any direction you want. And it is basically a form of weaving. Because if there is not a fixed warp and weft, you can change directions at any time. Uh, you can see how it is basically weaving over and under, over and under. You can see the weaving form, but the threads follow the direction of the design. And because they, are, they work in pairs, so you can get what basically is a stitch of weaving over and under, over and under, you can go in any direction you want. Um, Honiton is what is called a part or non-continuous bobbin lace. They make little sprigs and then join them into bigger pieces. And these are some very popular styles of Honiton motifs. Basically how Honiton pieces are made, collars, veils, cuffs, whatever, is they are made in little sprigs or bits and pieces. They choose a shape, place them in some sort of pleasing arrangement, and then join them with some sort of background. The background can be just about anything. They sometimes apply them to machine-made net, sometimes to handmade net, all kinds of backgrounds. Uh, but what is fun about English Honiton is it was not as regimented as the Belgian lace industry. They were free to do anything they want. Uh, there were, of course, commercial pieces that were made and sold in stores as collars, cuffs, veils, but a lot of people would simply go to their local lace dealer, say, I want a kind of bib-shaped lapel front collar, okay, this big, and then start picking out pieces from the inventory of the shop and have them arranged. And then very often it will be an assortment of expensive pieces like these that have fancy business on the leaves or more mundane shapes. And then they might say, well, okay, this is for a special occasion. Let's splurge and get a bird or a more expensive piece. And this one is fun because it has a separately made detached wing. And what is so much fun about Honiton is it just is a jumble of an English country garden. Um, flowers, leaves, and bugs, and birds, and butterflies, and all kinds of things. And this was perfect for the style that Marion was working on. Uh, can you see from where you are? Am I going to? It's fine. 
fine. You're fine. Okay. Thank you. It just yell or move. <laughs> I have to sit in the phone to get my hearing. Okay. Um, but the background is one of her designs, kind of an Art Nouveau sort of thing. And um, so anyway, let me get on to Marion. Uh, when she, uh, those, I have not yet seen her house. And I'm hoping Susan, my chauffeur, will drive past the house before we leave so I can actually finally see it. Um, I talk, over the years, I have talked to people who knew Marion, uh, but I have not yet seen the house. And I was always a little baffled about how could she have been apparently very happy, very active, very social, in this curious ramshackle cottage. And um, the other mystery, she was Marion Gray in the New York Times in her obituary. Um, so anyway, I know more about her life in lace than I do Marion in the person. And I am hoping when I meet some of you people that I can certainly stay in touch with you and get to know her personally and fill in some of the blanks that I didn't know. Uh, what I finally figured out, and those of you that knew Marion will be able to confirm or say you're totally on the wrong track. But my best guess was the reason she could have been so happy in Sneedon's in the little cottage in re it, from what I understand kind of rustic or um, not she didn't have a dishwasher I don't re expect I don't think okay okay uh, that the reason she could have been so comfortable in those circumstances goes back to her childhood in England yeah. and um, the pictures on the right are the area where she grew up and the kind of forests and country gardens she would have known. And this is just a little piece of a stone wall. Uh, before the lecture that I did last year, my niece, my blessed chauffeur, drove me through Sneedon's and I snapped a few pictures, but I thought, that certainly reminds me of the English countryside that she knew as a child and where she would have played with her brothers. And she and her brother um, Bertie and Llewellyn made up the Mabalulu, Marion, Bertie, and Llewellyn, Lulu, and they played in these gardens and woodlands and had a shed, cottage, whatever that was their playhouse that they called the Mabalulu. And they wrote poems, they wrote all kinds of things together. But what I really loved about this poem, the song of the Mabalulu, was this line here. Cheers for the three, may their forefathers' ghost scare all the knavish host of those that bore them. They did never, nothing, nothing boring ever in their lives. Everything was interesting, fascinating, wonderful. And so I thought she could have been very comfortable in quite rustic circumstances, in, especially in Sneedon's perched on the edge of the Hudson, because it would have reminded her of the Mabalu. Um, and yes. Is it okay to say something now? Oh yes, yes, absolutely. All right. Well yes. when she moved to Sneedon's, all of the houses were like that. My family moved there in nineteen forty one and you know everything was kind of ramshackle and that's what life was like in those yes. days. And she started out living down by the river in a house to the left of the road that goes down there, right across from Ernest Angel. And that was another old house too. So, but yeah, 
Well, very true. And she was born and raised in the late 1800s, and there were no dishwashers. Mm -hmm. There, you know, it, it was the way you lived. So the house that, that you're showing here was added on to a number of times, wasn't it, Alice? Was she the one who added on to it? No, I don't think it was added on to oh, very much. It was built about 1800 by the uh, Stephen by Stephen Hagen's father, I think. Oh, I had told I had read someplace that it was a couple of additions were made to it. Well, it doesn't look like it from this side, but it could have been that the the front door of that that little kitchen wing on the left was added. That's yeah, possible. Yeah, I but know. I have no record of it at all. Uh -uh. Okay. I will be really interested to talk to you folks. Alice actors. is our local historian. Oh, fabulous, she has, fabulous. She's the one to go to. I, I will, I will, I will. Okay, so now we come to Marion. And from what I have gleaned over the years is that she was one of a kind. There was, there, there were many incarnations of her the student of the world that wanted to escape from the vicarage in England, and her Aunt Kate was the key to getting her out of the little village so she would not spend the rest of her life in a rural town in England. Uh, author, wife and mother, uh, maybe wife not so much, uh, mother, um, lace merchant, Really a wonderful character. Uh, the little drawings in the corners are her designs, and I just love the little bat up in the corner. Um, artist and lace maker, mentor and teacher. Um, these are quotes from her son's writings. Uh, unremitting advocate of antique lace, perfervid tub thumper for antique lace. I think, wow, what an adjective to have. Um, but she certainly kept antique lace alive. And she was living in a unique time. Uh, this is her family. Uh, I don't have labels on all of the characters, but the map in the corner is really the key to her lace studies and her life in lace. Uh, she was born around here, they moved around here, but this is, uh, Honiton itself is maybe too small to be on the map. Oh, here it is, okay. Um, but it's all in a relatively small region. And why Honiton has so many different names? This is Devon, this is, Exeter, or uh, Somerset, it's at Dorchester, South Dorset. Um, the whole area was uh, a stronghold of lace making. And this is the time when she was living in England. And these are more examples of English Honiton. Uh, her great, 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 somewhere on her mother's side, I believe, was William Cowper, the poet. And the line that all lace makers love to quote, Jan Cottager who weaves at her own door, um, that was the history that she grew up with. And what, you know, it's hard to imagine nowadays making a life, a living through lace. But in those days, it was possible. Uh, these are other examples of English Honiton and the different kinds of backgrounds that you might have in the little birds and flying insects and things that you would find in a country garden. And then, of course, the overriding presence of Queen Victoria. Uh, Marion would have been about 11, a very impressionable age in my life, and I suspect in some of yours. Um, she, and her jubilee picture, is wearing her wedding lace. And among lace makers, that is renowned. Uh, she kept the Honiton, resurrected the Honiton lace industry by commissioning fabulous lace that required a whole 
team of lace makers to execute and she wore it through her life uh, is you know her jubilee portrait again reminding people of the Honiton lace industry uh, but that would have been Marion's background and here is a map of where she went to study uh, her aunt Kate apparently was her sponsor and I suspect maybe companion on some of these travels and studies. Uh, she, tra she studied in France, certainly in Belgium, uh, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, and she studied art, lace making, and history, which made her life as a lace expert, maker, dealer, designer, possible. But being smart people, uh, she also took typing, stenography, and shorthand, you know, as backup just in case this doesn't work so well. Uh, but she had an amazing education. Uh, those who knew her, how many languages did she speak? I have no idea. <laughs> okay, I was just curious because she apparently knew more than one in traveling in studying, and in the clientele that she had with her lace business. Okay, this is New York, about the time that Marion got here. And again, it reminds us of how her character in life was shaped. Uh, New York City, Times Square was very different in those days. But it was a very exciting time. It was a very active women's suffrage women's rights, a uh, lot of excitement going on. And also, lace was very in vogue in those days. Uh, this is an example of lace from the 1600s, remodeled as a vest or jacket, uh, probably for an afternoon, um, at the opera or something, but people wore, remodeled, used mm -hmm. antique lace. So it was very much known and in circulation, and major designers, ma major fashion characters in the early 1900s were wearing antique lace. So what brought her to the States? Where did she oh, go? excellent. Thank you. I can't skip that. That is most important in shaping her character. Uh, her brother was here. Uh, her brother, uh, John Cowper Powis, Powis, was on the Chautauqua circuit. Uh, the Chautauqua lecture circuit, uh, enlightenment, uh, learning, endless learning. Uh, but he was very well known. Uh, her family, all, her whole family was artists, poets, novelists, writers, and her brother was here, living in Greenwich Village in early 1900s. And he was her excuse to get here. It was approved for an unmarried woman to travel abroad to take care of her brother, like he needed to be taken care of in Greenwich Village. <laughs> but perfect. What a marvelous reason and a marvelous opportunity for her. Uh, she was about 30 by then. Uh, she was grown up, you know, she was not a child coming across. Uh, but he was well known. He was in the middle of wonderful circuits uh, of friends, circles of friends in Greenwich Village. Um, the person in the middle is Jessie Tarbox Beals, a woman photojournalist uh, taking pictures of professional 
women in business in Greenwich Village in the early 1900s. And there were marvelous characters in Greenwich Village. That was just, that had to have been just an electric time to be living there. Uh, this is Marion, of course. Uh, but these are some of the shops that she would have been neighbors with. Um, and this is the picture that Jesse Tarbox Beals took of Marion. And um, that is one of the drawings of Marion's that's on the table in the back. And I was always curious how many of these drawings that she did actually were executed and made into lace. And when I saw this picture, I just about jumped off my chair. I thought, whoa. You know, it's very out of focus. Artistic picture, blur the background, focus on your subject. But that sure looks to me like that design which now has me on a mission to find if that piece was actually executed. Um, but this is the picture that Jessie took, and this is Marion at her lace maker's pillow making lace. Um, okay, this is an example of one of her designs. Uh, it is a collar. Unfortunately, this piece got away and I wasn't able to bid on it when it went up for auction. Uh, but I did get pictures. Uh, I was very fortunate many years ago to visit her granddaughter who was living up in the Berkshires. And <coughs> the purpose of going there was to go through some of the lace that she still had from her grandmother's shop. I stayed with a friend in the little cottage on her farm. And she said, tomorrow, you know, we came in the middle of a rainstorm at night. And she said, tomorrow we'll go through Grandma's things. And I found out the next morning that under the bed I was sleeping in was a huge box of Marion's drawings. And this was one of the few pieces that actually had a finished lace piece, but at that time her granddaughter wasn't willing to part with it, but I was able to get pictures. But again, you can see, um, yes, oh my goodness, it worked. Can you see how it, it follows the weaving, the threads follow the curves of the design? Uh, very typical. And the other thing that's kind of fun, uh, 10 stick center, okay, uh, these the little trailing edges are what the English call tent stick, made with five pair of bobbins. Uh, different filling stitches. These are Marion's notes of how the piece was to be worked. Uh, this is another design that is on the table in the back. And an example of how wonderful her designs really are and how much thought went into these pieces. Uh, this is Columbine, um, and Columbine looked at from every viewpoint. If you look straight down on a Columbine flower, you see this. And what to me is just magical is the shape of the little petal horn things on a Columbine when you look at it from the top, have this little crescent shape. And look how she treated it at the border of the collar. Mm -hmm. She turned them into little birds. And I think that is just magical artwork. The, her view of the world in every nook and cranny and every viewpoint. Uh, here are buds. Columbine buds, and uh, here is a seed pod of a columbine, and when they crack open, you can see the seeds in each of these little pointy things. Uh, anyway, you can see the actual artwork on the back table. Uh, just absolutely wonderful artist. 
And these show the range of her designs. Uh, this one is very traditional, rather realistic, English country garden, uh, butterflies, bees, all kinds of little creatures. This was actually made up in uh, the, the notes on the piece of artwork say who she made it for. Uh, very possible that she worked it more than once. And this is another of her designs. This is quite traditional. This to me is more Art Nouveau, Art Modern, something like that. And then this is very, what, Cubist? Uh, so she was not stuck in any time period. Never boring. Her life intention to be never bored. Our, our father's ghosts will haunt you if you bore me. Um, but just the range of her designs and how she kept evolving and changing. Okay, in 1916 in Greenwich Village, she opened her Devonshire lace shop. Uh, Theodore Dreiser and her brother John Cowper uh, were the initial investors that got her started in her shop in Greenwich Village. Um, I am not sure where, where, when this business card was printed, but by then she had already moved from Greenwich Village to a higher tone um, address on Madison Avenue. Uh, in 1922, Marion Son Peter was born. 1923, Mr. Gray vanishes. Uh, and it was interesting to me that whenever I talked to people that knew her, um, that were friends of hers, the first thing they would always ask me is, do you know who Peter's father was? And I thought, well, if you don't know, I sure don't. Uh, and uh, Peter also said he didn't know who his father was. Marion wanted children. She didn't necessarily want a husband. So in, in, she did never boring, always audacious, lived the life she wanted to live. Okay, so she was here only a few years when she opened her lace shop. And this is a piece that was offered for auction when her estate well, the auction of her lace happened quite a few years after she passed away. Um, but this is a piece that was in that collection. This is another of her designs and another of those curious questions, a piece that I am looking for. Um, she designed a piece for Anne Morrow Lindbergh. And uh, supposedly it was for Anne Morrow wedding and from all the stories I have heard what I have kind of gleaned is that Anne Morrow didn't want it but Marion was out there looking for commissions associating with interesting people doing interesting designs uh, she was always out there tough thumping encouraging interest in lace. Uh, but um, there is a photograph here uh, in an article that her son wrote in American Craft Magazine in 1980 that suggests the scarf was actually made. Uh, but the story is Anne Morrow didn't want it and didn't buy it. Uh, but still a wonderful, charming design. Okay, let's get to her lace shop and some of the pieces, the, the kinds of things that she was selling. Uh, this kind of lace, these enormous flounces, probably 10 to 12 inches deep, several yards long. Uh, this was lace uh, that would have been used in the 1600s. And this would have been furnishing laces. Uh, there is a wood cut in one of the, I think, Palliser book that you were 
mentioning studying, um, where it shows a woman at a dressing table with a fontage high headdress uh, sitting at a dressing table with an enormous ruffle of lace. And this is the kind of yardage that would have been used. And in the 1920s, uh, Marion was selling this kind of lace. Um, and she was showing how you could use this. It, can't you just imagine a 1920s uh, fashionable character wearing this as a veil, uh, a narrower but similar piece as a wristband, uh, very dramatic fashion, but showing lace from the 15, 16, 1700s and how you could wear it today. Um, this is a church lace, uh, alb or surplus flounce, and she is turning it into a wearable. Uh, the pieces that we see here that Marion has posed on models, and it really says she had a high class lace shop. She was paying for very high class photography uh, to show how these pieces could have been worn. Many of the things that she is showing are minimal cutting of the lace. Uh, very often people use these as yard goods and cut them up into different shapes. Put a pattern on it, cut it out like paper dolls, made something. Uh, many of the things that she was doing are pretty much reversible. Uh, it is respecting the lace, but encouraging it to be out there and worn and shown. Uh, whoops, okay, which button? Okay, this is one of the key <coughs> pieces from her collection. Uh, this, if you recognize the emblem, is Napoleon. Uh, this is the Alençon bed set, very well known in the lace world, uh, commissioned by Napoleon uh, to support the Alençon lace industry. Uh, it consisted of these great drapes, the bedspread, and a flounce. Now, this is the piece that we are looking at here, uh, which Marion has posed. You are nouveau riche American. You want to knock the socks off all of your friends and neighbors. How better to do that than have your daughter wear Napoleon's bedspread as a wedding veil? Um, and the audacity of suggesting that is, I think, is just wonderful. Uh, but obviously, a very professional photograph. And the whole bed set, uh, there is another story that could go on forever. Uh, but the pieces were split up over various museums. It is not really clear which pieces Marion actually sold, but she certainly had it in her shop to photograph, to promote. Uh, this is an article over here that I did in a newsletter that I did some years ago. Um, but this uh, bed hanging fragment is in the Cooper Hewitt. Uh, this is the website from the Cooper Hewitt. And Richard Cranch Greenleaf was another uh, really interesting character at the beginning of the 1900s. Uh, a man of money, um, well-to-do family. He lived in France for many years. And it's almost a magical, miraculous story. He collected a lot of lace when he was living with his mother in uh, Barbizon, a suburb of Paris, and collected lace. 
1941, he and his mother thought, oh, we really need to get out of Europe. This is beyond dangerous here. He hid his lace collection on a friend's farm, and it was not lost or destroyed. After the war was over, he went back and reclaimed it. Uh, but this would have been something that he would have bought in the United States. Uh, and eventually gave to the Cooper Hewitt. Okay, these are the kinds of stories that Marion spun around the pieces that she had. Uh, this is another piece of a set that she talked to one of the owners. Here is the inventory of pieces that went with this set. This, to the best of my guess was lace from the 1500s remodeled. This design just screams Regency 1800. Uh, so around, somewhere around 1800, apparently the lace was made into a set for the Ranfurly family. Um, and Constance Ranfurly talks about how it belonged to it you know, it was in this palace, um, et cetera, et cetera. But it, what it, this is kind of provenance, but not really. It's family stories being woven. Uh, we will never know for sure whether this was actually lace that uh, belonged to the Stuarts, et cetera, et cetera. But these are the kinds of stories that Marion used to sell her lace. Uh, this is an article that Marion wrote for Fortune magazine in 1930. If you think about what was going on in 1930, that was the Depression here. Uh, prices on lace were really iffy. Inter she could see interest in lace disappearing. And what she is doing in this article is, re again, tub thumping, promoting lace and promoting lace collectors. Uh, these are the brilliant pieces that were collecting lace. Mrs. J.P. Morgan, Mrs. George Blumenthal, Mrs. Philip Lehman, um, notable lace collector, uh, Mrs. Hutton, Mrs. E.F. Hutton. Okay, uh, their husband's investments, they were, her, their husbands were in the middle of the turmoil in the stock market. And Marion was promoting uh, their lace and promoting lace collection and promoting the pieces that she had sold to people to ensure their value stayed. But here again, she is weaving these wonderful, never boring stories. Oh, whoops, let me back up. Uh, this is the button for the arrow. <coughs> to England's Virgin Queen belonged this apron. That language is classic Marian writing. Uh, but the coffee spot was made by Mistress Dorothy Fairfax. Oh, the Queen was not pleased. Okay, this lace, this coffee stain. How on earth does anybody know that that coffee was spilled in the presence of Queen Elizabeth? Uh, but doesn't that make a wonderful story? And don't you want to just go out and buy this and have this tea stain, coffee stain? Uh, it may be seen at the Devonshire Lace Shop. Huh. You may have it, strings, coffee spot and all, for $600. Okay, $600 in 1930 mm -hmm. translates to about $12,000 today. Uh, the market is not there. Uh, so, her lace shop closed in 1945. Uh, but still, she was a never boring, always interesting, uh, really Promoting women, promoting women's rights. Um, this is a card from, 
Not sure if it was a successor of the Devonshire Lace Shop. I think it was a contemporary that kind of merged when she closed her shop. Uh, but we are pleased to announce that Mrs. Inez Carl, formerly with the Devonshire Lace Shop, is now associated. Well, okay, look. Uh, the Devonshire Lace Shop was 556. Where is the real lace shop? 556. Okay, maybe a different floor of the same building. I'm not quite sure. Uh, you know, maybe it will be revealed at one time. But Mrs. Inez Carl is a very interesting person in her own right. Uh, she was a young black woman. So not only was she was Mary and promoting women, she was promoting diversity. Um, so anyway, uh, when she closed her shop, her influence continued. Uh, these are bits and pieces from her lace shop. You can see someone spent their whole life doing nothing but making tiny little dots to be used in powdering the field scattered over wedding veils and pieces. Uh, okay, so she, in 1953, when Marion was about 70, she is still frantic to promote the lace industry. Um, she wrote a really interesting book. Uh, it has to be assessed as a product of the time and the character that wrote it. I think as are all books. Uh, she is covering the whole universe, the beauty of lace, the naming of lace, the pedigree, the key, everything, lace design, church lace, decorators lace, bridal laces, lace collecting directions. She is covering the universe in this book which is on the table back there and, of course, in the museum. Um, this is a page that for years was used as a guide for lace collectors. Um, little bits and scraps. This is another of these magical stories that Marion was writing. Uh, this piece has wonderful clues in it. Uh, C.B. Baronet, uh, a date in here someplace. Um, so Marion wove this wonderful story about this lace being made for Catherine of Braganza, C.B. Well, it, well, Baronet has nothing to do with it. Catherine of Braganza that was about to marry the king. So that's one clue that doesn't quite work, but doesn't phase Mary. And she continues this wonderful story about how this lace was on the boat going from Honiton to Spain for her marriage. Uh, okay, some years later, someone else in England came along and did more research on that. And he was determined to figure out who exactly was C.B. Baronet and did a lot of research and found out it was Copleston Bampfield. Everything fits. He, it, the date 1661 fits. He was a loyal supporter of the royalty. All of the clues fit. Okay, eventually someone unraveled the mystery, and even the Art Institute of Chicago, which now owns this piece, agrees. It's not Catherine Braganza, but Copleston Bampfield. But still a wonderful story, and it helps us understand what Marion was doing with this book. She's trying to pump up lace, an interest in lace. Okay. Not only was she doing the book, she also did a wonderful lace installation at the Tibor Dinaj Gallery, um, still existing in Manhattan. 
And Tibor was one of the people that I visited to get information on this remarkable exhibit that she did. They were pioneers in the idea of um, installation art, not just pinning things to the wall, but doing act, showing them. Uh, there are a couple of other pieces. To us now, this looks a little primitive. Uh, the idea that a Manhattan gallery would have red balloons stuck on the wall. Um, but the concept is magical. They had interesting lighting that would cast shadows. Uh, they had fans positioned in the room to make the pieces flutter and make the shadows move. And they also commissioned uh, Parker, Tyler, Tyler Parker, I would have to back up to see. But he wrote a poem for this. And to me today, this is a little bit creepy, uh, but presumably was the taste of the era. Lace is the tender flower that grows, uh, and they're talking about nourished by the dew of human flesh. Uh, a little creepy for me. Uh, the weave relaxes and tenses with the flow of feeling. Okay, fine. Um, but the idea that they were doing something so imaginative and so creative to promote lace at a time when it was dead in the market. And according to Tibor, after he asked me if I knew who Peter's father was, he gave me pictures and stories and all these other things. Okay. So now we come back to the end. Uh, Marion Powis, Powis, known in her obituary, presumably the New York Times, even that late in the game, was protecting her reputation as Mrs. Gray rather than Marion Powis, single mom at a time that wasn't fashionable yet. Um, so 1972, and now, this is something that I just recently found in the picture. Is that a wine glass in her hand? Probably. <laughs> I love it. I thought, oh, she was happy in that little house. Okay, here in 1992 is the auction of her lace in Phillips in London. And that was an event of all events. And it knocked me out that it was on my birthday and I couldn't go. Uh, but do you recognize this piece from earlier in the lecture that was a background for her Devonshire lace shop? And this, to me, it, and okay, the reason I had the other photograph in color is because I was able to buy that piece from another auction house in the past few years. Things go through cycles. Things that were sold in 1992 come back up for auction again. Someone buys it, it's in their collection. They move on to something else and their lace goes up for sale. Uh, but what was fun for me is to be able to actually put my hands on this see the description in the Phillips catalog, assuming that they might have gotten descriptions from Marion to, as to the dates, which I really wondered about. This is a very interesting piece. Lots of men's, lots of things going on. But it was fun to actually see it. OK, and that is my story of Marion. Oh, thank you, thank you.